Good morning, everyone. This is Jeffy Kennedy, author of Epic Fantasy Romance. I'm here with my first cup of coffee. Ah, oh, delicious. Today is, y'all say it with me, Friday, woohoo, September 22nd, 2023. Uh, yeah, beautiful golden September. And it has been a week here at uh, Shea Kennedy. Ah, so, so here's what's been going on here. And I hadn't mentioned it before. I've got my phone in my lap because I'm potentially waiting for a phone call. I can mention why. It's not very exciting. It's just um, I didn't want to miss it if it comes in. There is a, a, a stink bug down here eating a grape. <laughs> the grapes are falling. Leaves and grapes. Um, anyway, so uh, I hadn't mentioned this on social media yet because I wasn't sure if I could. And my friend hadn't mentioned it because she wasn't sure if she should. We're busy respecting each other's privacy. But now this is an open open information. So anyway, on Monday, my friend Mary Robinette Kowal arrived and she brought with her um, the dog Captain. Captain is a chocolate lab and he was her mom's service dog uh, assisting with Parkinson's. Uh, Mary Robinette's mom had Parkinson's. She passed away at the end of July, very sadly. Um, interestingly, we had had the plan before this to transfer Captain to David because her mom had progressed to the point uh, where she could no longer really use the dog. She had gone to using a scooter. Uh, and Mary Robinette was supposed to come out here and potentially, uh, I think we'd been talking about end of July, beginning of August, somewhere in there. Um, and then she had said that her mom was declining and she'd better stay close to home. And then her mom passed away. So anyway, uh, I, apparently not everybody knows this. I thought I'd been pretty open about it, but my husband, David has Parkinson's. He's about, um, 13 years into diagnosis. He is fairly stable and good at walking, but, uh, we thought it'd be really helpful for him to, to have the dog the partner dog. So Mary Robinette arrived late Monday afternoon. She's been here all week and she is gifting us with this wonderful dog. Uh, so I have to tell you all my writing this week, it's just like nothing. <laughs> Gotten so little done this week. <gasps> oh, so much for my ramping up. Um, it's just been crazy. Uh, it didn't, no, let me take it back. It hasn't been crazy. It's been, it's been a lot. It's been exhausting um, in a way that I did not predict. I really thought that I would be able to carry on with my usual routine and Mary Robinette would work with David to teach the commands and stuff. And it's interesting people who have, um, people that they care for in their household, neurodivergent people, or that are in, heavily involved in like elder care and that sort of thing. They're all like, well, yes, of course, this has been exhausting, Jeffy. I was like, I just didn't predict that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been emotionally exhausting. It's been, um, I, it's hard. It's hard for me to explain. Maybe, um, those of you out there who maybe some of you instantly grok this, uh, like some of my other friends did. It's, uh, you know, just the, the transition at the Tuesday, Tuesday was a terrible day. Um, there was just too much going on. We tried to do too much too fast. David trying to learn the commands and captain, uh, getting used to being in a new place and having traveled and be discombobulated 
and um, the cats, the cats getting used to the dog. Uh, they're doing much better now. So to fast forward, last night is the first night that uh, Captain stayed the night with us. Uh, the other nights he had been going back with Mary Robinette to stay in um, actually my friend Megan's casita. So we are infinitely grateful for the hospitality of the casita this week. Uh, it's been a great place for Mary Robinette to, to stay. Um, Captain's been going back with her every evening. And then last night was the first night he stayed with us. And the cats are getting more accustomed to, to the dog being here. Uh, our older cat, Jackson, has lived with a dog before. Our younger cat, Killian, I'm not sure if she, he had ever seen a dog before. So he was considerably freaked out at first. Uh, he's seen coyotes out here um, outside the window barking at him and being obnoxious. So I think he was worried a coyote had gotten inside. But now everybody is settling down. There were some rough spots last night. Uh, it's just been a huge transition. Um, yeah, so finally what I had to do by like Wednesday morning was get out of the middle of it. Because on Tuesday, I think I was way too involved. And it really had to be with, you know, because David was telling me stuff. He's like, well, I'm going to do this or I'm not going to do that. And I'm like, you know what? You need to talk directly to Mary Robinette about this. You need to work this out with her and tell her what you want to learn and what you want to use this dog for. Um, yeah, it was just, it was, it's just been a lot. Uh, and it's interesting to me, like, which my friends immediately understand that this has been uh, an exhausting week and others who, who don't, <laughs> who just don't. So, um, yeah, Mary Robinette will be here for a couple more days. Hopefully we'll get to do a little bit of touring about and playing. Uh, hopefully going to get her up to Abiquiu. And in fact, I should check on one thing. So, um, so yeah. One thing that's uh, funny with Mary Robinette, because I've introduced her to a few people here. She's gotten to meet people and talk and talk about her background. And <clears throat> her background is in puppets, one of the, in theater, and she had a career in puppetry for 20 years. And two different people said to her, oh, have you seen Forgetting Sarah Marshall? And she's like, oh, I haven't. And they're like, oh, there's puppets on that. And I think it's funny that two different people, two different occasions said this to her. And so I said, well, you know, we can watch it. So last night she came over, I made dinner, and we watched Forgetting Sarah Marshall, which is always a funny movie. And so, you know, I was like, you'll enjoy watching it because it's fun. But what's funny is, is, you know, the puppets don't come into the movie until the very, very end. It's a very small part of the movie. And we were both commenting on that, that it's funny that that sticks with people enough that two separate people said to her, you know, oh, have you seen this movie in regards to puppetry? And then I just have to give a general shout out um, that this is just a, a heroic and amazing thing that Mary Robinette is doing for us, um, giving us this dog uh, for which she paid a tremendous amount of money to get for her mom, uh, which we would not be able to afford on our own, and spending a week of her life with us uh, dealing with this, uh, with David, the occasionally cranky. Although I think one reason why I had to step out of the middle is I think he is less cranky to other people than he is to me. The, the, uh, the joys of long-term relationships, right? So, um, so yeah, that's been pretty wonderful. Wonderful and exhausting, all of these things. Um, I have a special request from, from my mother, actually, to explain what AI is, explain what artificial intelligence is. And when she put it to me, she said, 
someday you're going to have to explain this to me. And I said, well, I'll make a note to talk about it on the podcast on Friday because I'd referenced it on Monday. And she said, well, I think I'm the only one who doesn't understand what it is. And I said, that's not true. I think there are vast misunderstandings in what it is. Uh, and part of it is because this is such a rapidly changing technology. Uh, and we are kind of in this transition phase of going from something which has been the stuff of science fiction um, and reality moving into that futuristic thing. So what we are calling AI, what we are calling artificial intelligence is not the AI of science fiction. It's really a misnomer. And I know this because not being techie me, uh, that's the only downside of having my phone in my lap is that I'm getting uh, text messages <laughs> too. Uh, that's Dorinda actually talking about what is our schedule today. It's been a crazy week, right? Um, so when we talk about artificial intelligence in science fiction, oh, I know what I was starting to say. I was giving my cred on this because I am not a techie person but uh, John Murphy, who is vice president of CIFWA, is a techie person. And he has actually done uh, his uh, graduate degrees in like language learning models. And I will tell you what those are. But he knows a lot about this. And he's been the one who has collated a lot of the information on AI for CIFWA's statement on it and so forth. And so he's explained a great deal to me. Uh, so the AI of science fiction, uh, is usually something like, like the sentient computer howl from 2001 space odyssey, right? Uh, it is the idea <laughs> All right, I'll stop texting with Rina. Oh, she keeps texting me. All right. So when I was in neuroscience, when I was getting my graduate degree in neuroscience, there were all kinds of people who were working on computer modeling to mimic neural models. So basically they were trying to create a computational analog of the human brain, right? So we have like in Star Trek Next Generation, we have data, right? Lieutenant data who has the positronic brain and basically the positronic brain was, I mean, he's an artificial intelligence, right? It's this created intelligence instead of born with a squishy human brain, he is born, he is made, right? It is a computer, um, human made version of human intelligence. So if we take, Lieutenant Data as being like the high end of artificial intelligence, right? And and he's a great example because, um, you know, my friend Melinda Snodgrass, she wrote the Star Trek Next Generation episode, The Measure of a Man, in which they test whether or not Data is, is a living being or is he a, a robot? Is he a machine? Is he a person? Uh, and, and it's interesting, you know, like, how do you decide? How do you decide what is simply mimicking human intelligence? What's a sophisticated program? Because we have computers, right, that can win chess matches against chess masters, right? But that's all equations, right? It's, it's all the math that's in there. So what's going on today is we have all of these enterprising tech companies referring to what they're doing as AI, as artificial intelligence, because it's sexy and interesting, right? But really what they are, are sophisticated computer programs. And, you know, drawing from the example of Lieutenant Data, this line where we decide what is, what is, uh, sophisticated program and what is artificial intelligence and what is human intelligence, right? 
we we don't have definitions for these things but we do know that calling what we have now artificial intelligence really is a misnomer uh no matter what places like chat gpt are claiming what it is is it's it's a language learning model or machine language and so if we think about chess where you take um you put in all of the rules that these pieces can move in these ways and this is the objective and you know here are the infinite possibilities of how this game can play out it's the computer learns right <clears throat> well a program like chat gpt which is a program and it was released and you know I think via like iPhone apps and that sort of thing. I, I don't have it. I've never tried it. But what they did was they took language and are taking language and feeding it into the computer so that the computer learns how to string language together in new ways. So this is one of the problems with the writing community in that what they've done is they've taken books and fed the books into this computer for it to learn how to write a book. So without paying any of the authors. So there's a lot of debate. Is this theft? And of course, the, um, the tech bros are like, no, these books were available for free. They did a lot of scraping of like uh, archive of our own AO3 because that's put up for free. Uh, they took books that were offered for free by authors as um, marketing tools. They've probably also taken books that were not offered for free. And the computer takes those things and mashes them up. And people are using this as a shortcut to write. So I know of a number of people who like want to have always wanted to write a novel, right? All these people who always wanted to write a novel because they've got the great idea for a novel, but they don't actually want to have to sit down and spend the time to write. Uh, they take their ideas and they feed it into chat GPT and they can say things like, um, write a novel with a horse, his boy, and um, a magical sword in the style of C.S. Lewis and the computer program will spit something out. And then they, I don't know, presumably edit it. Uh, apparently a lot of people are just throwing things up. There was an interesting case of a lawyer that used uh, chat GPT for a, like a brief for a court document. I don't know exactly what it was. Uh, and what's funny is, is that chat GPT was able to pull out previous examples of cases where this had happened. Only none of them turned out to be real because the computer can't distinguish between, for example, if I write a book about a plane crash and I say, oh, it's Delta 917 that, you know, burned up because of this that thing, the computer finds that and says, oh, here's an example. And it put it into this lawyer's case. Um, not great, right? So, so basically what they are calling artificial intelligence would be like, if, you know, like this comes back to that human creativity, right? Chat GPT, a computer, maybe someday, but we're certainly not at the point where it can create a story that is creatively generated. What it's doing is it's taking puzzle pieces that have had the edges filed off and mashing them together and saying, here is something that contains all of the elements of what you asked for. Uh, yeah, so, so that's it in a nutshell. It is much more accurate when people talk about it to call it machine language or a language learning model rather than AI, but everybody's calling it AI because that's what the tech bros want to call it. 
um, AI generated art works in exactly the same way. They have taken art from human artists, fed it in, and then you can, you know, put in your terms and say, I want a red headed woman. And, you know, they argue that there's creative input to this because then they have to refine it and everything. But, but is it? Uh, humans always looking for shortcuts, right? Right. Not all, uh, because, and I'm going a little bit over today, but you know, if we come back to this thing about the people who always wanted to write a novel, if only they could find the time. And, you know, we've talked about that extensively on this podcast over the years. The thing about learning to write a book is is that there, all of the virtue lies in the journey, folks. It's not having the product. It's not being able to flip your book around and say, look how special I am. It's, it's about the creative journey. It's about the pain. It's about the difficulty of making yourself work day after day after day and learning to pull together from yourself how to tell a story, refining your craft, uh, building your creative flow, clearing out those pipes. You know, it's, um, well, enough said on that. What, why as human beings, do we try to do a thing? Are we only trying to do it to impress other people or are we doing it to learn and grow as human beings? And I think the answer to that will hugely depend on, uh, who's answering the question. So on that note, uh, that should give you some things to think about. I hope you all have a great weekend. I will talk to you all on Monday. You all take care. Bye-bye.